Thank you, Carolyn. This is uh, Pranoti Asher from the American Geophysical Union. I'm very pleased that you've all joined us this afternoon. I am also very excited to have this particular webinar because we have two university provosts who are joining us today. And the title of the webinar is Program and Personnel Management in an Increasingly Stressed Environment. So Carolyn, if you could just go to the next slide. Thank you. Our, our two panelists today are Alison Morrison Shetler and Patrick Lucharn. Alison is a provost and vice chancellor for academic affairs and a professor of biology at Western Carolina University, and where she sees uh, a whole bunch of colleges uh, in it, at the university. In addition to that, she has also had over 30 years of experience in higher education uh, at many different institutions and on several continents, um, both in public as well as private universities. She has served as a dean at Elon University. She was the vice provost and dean of undergraduate studies and the director of the Teaching and Learning Center at University of Central Florida, as well as uh, the director of the Center for Excellence in Teaching as a faculty member at Georgia Southern University. She has been awarded many millions of dollars of external grant monies on research topics that range from molecular and biological and physiological aspects of cell membrane transport systems to uh, pedagogy investigations in classrooms and STEM learning and student engagement, retention, and graduation. She's a native of Scotland and has uh, earned her degrees in biomedical science from uh, Dundee College of Technology. I'm also very pleased to introduce our second panelist, Patrick Lasharn, who is a marine scientist, oceanographer, geoscientist uh, of all stripes and has done lots of multidisciplinary research to understand the impacts of environmental perturbations on biogeochemical cycling at ecosystem interfaces. He has gotten his uh, undergraduate and graduate degrees in, in marine biology and in environmental science. His PhD is from the University of Quebec. He has, uh, he started out as a faculty, as a postdoc fellow at the University of Texas Marine Science Institute and then held a research position at Texas Engineering Experimental Station at Texas A&M, then became a faculty in, in the environmental sciences at Texas A&M in the Corpus Christi campus then joined Columbia University and co-directed a new master's program in public administration there, after which he was appointed as a professor in the Columbia's, uh, Columbia's Department of Earth and Environmental Sciences. He then joined Texas A&M, the Galveston campus, and Texas A&M as a professor in marine sciences and oceanography, became a department head, a full professor, and now he is currently the vice president for academic affairs and their chief academic officer at the Galveston campus and the associate provost at Texas A&M, uh, the main campus. So I'm going to stop right there and I'm going to ask our two wonderful panelists to take it away. Well, thank you very much, Bernardi. This is Patrick and uh, <clears throat> I will um, go through a few slides and welcome to all the attendees and thank you so much for your time. And I want to thank Fred Panodi for offering the uh, the opportunity to actually uh, speak to all of you and and uh, share with Allison um, our experience um, through the process of leading academic units, uh, particularly from you know perspective of science, if you will. Um, we had a number of conversations with Allison, and one of the things that we agreed on is uh, making a difference or making a distinction. Uh, between uh, what falls into what we call management and what falls into leadership. Um, it seems to be pretty straightforward, but um, a lot of the time we tend, that's my experience, and I speak a lot from my own perspective, uh, my own experience have uh, taught me that I've, I've tended still today to be really bogged down with all the managerial tasks. And, you know, I try to um, I've, I've read quite a bit on, on the difference between the two, and that's pretty easy to find. Um, but you'll see that, um, you know, there are some very uh, specific distinctions between the two. And management, and by the way, when I make those distinctions, I don't, you know, think that uh, you should do one or the other exclusively. We are constantly going between one and the other. We tend 
to uh, not see too much the usage piece and spend too much in energy and time on the management piece. And I think my takeaway uh, overall is to try to find the people um, that work in your team with which you can delegate some of the management piece so you can actually really spend the time when it's more needed in the leadership piece. And you can see I try to have four bullets where I see, uh, you know, I contrast some uh, differences between, for example, in management setting procedures and guidelines so you really operate and setting a vision for leadership where you really are trying to articulate what your unit should look like in the future. Um, you work in management, and I'm sure most of you have had this um, encounter, uh, accountability to a number of stakeholders, whether they're students, faculty, um, you know, your administration, uh, or donors, or external uh, public individuals or industry. Whereas as a leadership, I think that you really work with communication with all of these uh, groups to tell the story of, you know, who you are, your unit, what you do, and where you should be. Resource allocation is definitely a management piece, whereas resource development, I think, is more leadership, finding the resources to actually push your unit forward. And create a sense of responsibility, um, and I'll argue uh, urgency, um, you know, our responsibility for management, whereas for leadership, it's really trying to create a commitment from the unit uh, members towards the movement, towards, um, you know, that those particular goals you've set, and I call it the sense of urgency, and I have a reference at the, at the end that actually um, gives um, a, a pretty interesting read uh, on creating a sense of urgency. I don't know if you wanted to add anything, Allison. No, I think you've got it uh, right there. Uh, this Good. Is, uh, 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 for me, it's uh, putting the moniker over this of a servant leader and what servant leadership means. And with management and leadership, it's a combination that really helps uh, people be responsible for moving the the goals of the institution forward. So next, if you don't, if you please, Carolyn. So uh, we wanted to have a few examples of some of the things that you probably have encountered or will definitely encounter in your uh, positions as chairs or heads, uh, depending on the time that you've been in your positions. You will for sure already have dealt or thought about uh, tenure and promotion. My guess is most of you have already actually served on some of those committees, so you know the intricacies of the uh, process. And it's really a process that's very specific. I mean, there is, you can go back, and I always like to refer to, you know, the uh, university professors' um, uh, guidelines of the 1940s and 70s on uh, tenure and academic freedom. It's a very easy um, document that actually sets the, the the reasons for, for us, you know, working to tenure. But promotion and tenure is very specific to every university. We all do it slightly differently, and you have to be uh, clear, and I'll talk to uh, more about that, but it's really in the management piece. Um, in management, if you actually have degrees, you will have students that graduate, therefore you're accountable to graduation rate, placement rates, and all of that, so you have to manage those numbers. Management is really dealing with numbers, if you will. And of course, resource allocation, where it's research space, credit funding, um, and et cetera, and to some extent, a little bit of faculty assignments. Leadership is, to me, some of the examples that you may have already encountered as a, as a head or chair, is um, how do you communicate how important it is, and I will say more about this later, for your faculty and your student body to be diverse and to actually represent a vast array of different perspectives. And diversity can be defined in many different ways, and they will be different depending on the type of degrees and the type of programs. And how does that mean? What does that mean for you? And how do all of these uh, different actors get behind a common um, action, if you will? Uh, leadership is really communicating well. You know, newsletter forums, advisory boards. How do you interact with all the stakeholders very constantly to actually tell your story? I always say when I was a department head to the faculty, you know, tell your narrative, somebody else will. And I think that's, that also applies to the chair. But the narrative now is for the whole. And of course, as a head or chair, you start actually getting engaged with donors, foundations, industry, community leaders, depending on your uh, field, if you have uh, strong ties to industry or not. But still, in many ways, you actually deal and have to communicate with uh, external uh, entities. 
budget. So then we have a few specifics that you know we've we've identified. We want to kind of. I don't know that it's necessary best practice um, because you know I've dealt with a number of budgets. I think that the you know the theme of this particular uh, webinar is you know managing and leading under stress conditions, and I think that it's pretty uh, pretty clear that uh, universities have to adapt uh, irrespective of where you are, where you're from, the conditions under which you um, you work, whether you're a private or you're a public institution, or large or small, you have issues of budgets and you have to actually manage resources. Uh, I can tell you right now we are uh, in the middle of you know major um, budget um, planning for the next two years for our state and that's always a very stressful uh, discussion for everyone involved from the faculty all the way to the top administrators. And the vast majority of time, uh, you know, we hear uh, the discussion of having to do more with less. <clears throat> yes, that's true. You have to do with less most of the time <clears throat> unless you find alternative uh, income or revenue streams. But I don't believe, uh, through my own experience, that, you know, the mantra of doing more with less is a very sustainable one. Uh, most of the time when you do that, you end up doing a whole lot of things not very well. So you have to have a very clear conversation with your stakeholders, particularly your faculty and the people with whom, to whom you report and report to you, on, to, on identifying what are the clear priorities for your unit. Because you'll have to make choices. And priorities is really not about what you're you know, going to do, but it's really what you're not going to do, what you decide to stop doing. So you can spend all the resources that you have on the things that you actually think are the most important for your unit. And for that, uh, you really have to interact with your stakeholders, have a very clear uh, communication stream and get them involved. Be very transparent on the process of selecting those uh, priorities and making sure that it represents the majority of uh, stakeholders. And that is a very critical piece. And what has worked the best for me in budget allocations and, and distribution and even this decision on priorities was really having collaborative, collective, and high representation on um, advisory groups, whether faculty or um, advisors, even students to some extent. Next, Carolyn, if you please. Strategic planning, well, that actually goes straight into um, to me into setting priorities, but now you're kind of playing the long uh, the long game. To some extent, I think personally that budget should be the long game, but sometimes budgets are really trying to address very short-term uh, uh, issues, uh, hiding the faculty for some courses that you need to have taught. But you also have to have this, this gauge of the long-term goals that you're seeking to, uh, to accomplish. So more than anything is, you know, where do you want to be? You know, really having a very clear discussion with your group. Where do you want to be as a group? What defines you? Um, and defining, and you as a leader need to be part of defining that clear vision. You can set the conversation. You'll have to listen because it might be that you have people who disagree with you. But you are in that position of actually leading the group and having to actually uh, negotiate, if you will, to actually take that group to that particular vision. Um, whether you want quantitative goals or not, it's up to the group. It's up to you. I can tell you we have done this recently, and actually ours is one year old, so we have four years to go. Every single one of our goals had very specific quantitative metrics, and those were chosen as a group. So that's what we chose to do because we felt we needed to have a little bit of that pressure. But it doesn't have to be, to my, to my experience. You know, it really has to uh, go along with what the group needs. So you have to really make that a collective effort. And making sure that you listen, you distribute those very uh, often, that you have fears of either through fora or online uh, input, that you can incorporate some of the comments from the different stakeholders. Next, please. One area that we all have to actually address um, in, in academia, and we've heard quite a bit of it um, in the past uh, few years, and we will continue to uh, work through this in the coming years, uh, because it's, it's an issue of making our uh, learning and working spaces safe for all the actors in these environments, is understanding what Title IX is. And um, sometimes when we come into those positions, 
one of the things that I forgot to mention is that most of us have come to our positions from in an expertise in our field and some seniority in that field and that's only we are asked well why don't you manage this group and we've had never any formal for the vast majority of us at least the place for me any formal um, training in leadership and even management and particularly in all the role, rules and regulations that actually um, drive our universities and one of those in laws particularly one of those like title nine you know comes from the 70s and i've taken a quick definition you know from the web of what it is it's basically trying to to ensure that no one is excluded no one is denied access and benefit and no one is discriminated against and it's not about athletics although Title IX plays a big part in athletics or did play but it really is about workplace climate and particularly I see it as safety and equity so it's very important to to me get very educated in what Title IX is get trained um, as a leader you need to not everyone in your in your unit needs to, but you will have to have, at least the university will have to have very well-trained investigators and be very responsive. If anything, my own experience, and unfortunately, I have to admit that, um, you know, like many uh, probably of you, I have had to deal with Title IX issues. They are never easy. We trained, we are very, you know, we're very good at training the investigators we are not good at talking to the people in your position who are going to have to deal with these uh, the results of these investigations and in that case we end up feeling very alone sometimes not quite knowing how to deal with the results that um, are I can tell you sometimes very disturbing and uh, emotionally they're very taxing so you need to understand that you will be put in positions that will be emotionally draining and in that case, you need to have a series, and I'll repeat that many times, allies and mentors that have been through this that can actually guide you. You have to know who your legal counsels are. You have to seek counsel, understand where you are, so you can do this uh, well, and you can do this quickly. Uh, not put it aside, because this is a very significant issue that um, that is all around us. And what, in the end, we want to do is all of us work in a safe environment and make sure we offer that safe environment for everyone. Next. And speaking of safe environment, um, this is something that I have very close to my heart for a lot of personal reasons, um, but I have worked you know, for the past four, almost five years now on our campus to really drive our uh, discussions and actions on diversity and inclusion. And um, the little graph, uh, you know, on the side, Pernodi, uh, the M&Ms, you know, brought it up, but the quote is something that I heard on NPR, and I kind of liked it. It's very simple, right? Diversity. What is diversity? Is at least it was defined like this: being invited to the dance. Inclusion is being invited to act to partake in the dance floor, you know, on the dance floor. And it really is a matter for everyone to have access and everyone to enjoy uh, all of the benefits of being in an institution, whether they're students, faculty. Why is this important? Because we need, of course, to be creative in our environment. We need more perspectives, and we need, you know, to have uh, all perspective and be respected for for their, their voice. And um, they bring um, everyone brings uh, richness to that discussion. And I say everyone, because you know, having a diversity goal is one that actually leads to inclusion, meaning everyone feels that they're valued. I, I saw as, as, as an executive leader, you realize you have certain powers on the structural changes, but less so on the non-structural changes other than being clear on your vision and how that relates to your personal and the institution's core values. I think the structural changes, you can um, always work on those, eliminating or eroding barriers to participation making sure that you know everybody is you know promoted in the same way or evaluated in the same way that you know that um, search uh, uh, for faculty are very equitable that I have a good representation um, being clear that if for example a search committee brings you candidates and you think that they haven't done a really good job in, um, in attracting interest from a diverse set of backgrounds that you can send it back it's perfectly okay for you to put your foot down and say, no, I don't think you've done 
enough effort to recruit interest. In the end, what matters is the quality of the of the uh, of the candidates, and you know, and the standards by which you you evaluate those candidates. But recruiting, you know, uh, making an effort to recruit beyond the very typical uh, streams that we know takes some effort, and sometimes you're surprised by the interest and the diversity of uh, of candidates that you attract. So you can have a serious impact and a very significant one on structural changes. The non-structural changes is really building a culture and that takes longer and that takes a whole lot more clarity of, of expression from your part in saying what you really um, identify as a core value to you and how your unit should look like and making sure that you know you allow people to be included in those discussions is more importantly repre uh, represented and have influence. And then that's where we're going to be uh, switching with Allison. Um, my very quick um, point on foreign nationals, as you may uh, tell from my accent, um, I am not from East Texas. I'm way, way east on the other side of the pond. Um, but I have been an immigrant all my life. I have been a, an international student all my life since I was a very young child. And to me, uh, of course, uh, hiring foreign nationals, whether the faculty, students, bringing students or graduate students is uh, very dear to me. And to, to me, to a certain extent, that is, has a certain diversity component. An international student faculty is always a minority in the environment in which we work. And as such, they will actually experience the minority uh, strains and constraints that any other minority feel in an underrepresented role. And we have to understand how we can actually smooth out their incorporation, for example, visa issues, uh, language issues, and all kinds of other, and cultural approaches to learning and communicating. So um, being sensitive to those uh, uh, you know, cultural experiences and what they bring to enrich the experience of students and other faculty is really critical, critical to me as a leader. And I'll hand off to Allison at this point. Great, thank you, Patrick. And I, I will continue with the foreign nationals component. Uh, the, as also someone who is not from this country, uh, I'm originally from Scotland, uh, as Pranuti mentioned, uh, it's really important that you think about um, who you're attracting to your institution and also making sure that as we're facilitating cross-cultural understanding, we're also looking at what are the needs of those individuals coming to a different uh, area, a different place. Um, we here at Western Carolina University, we're in a very rural uh, area, and uh, not everyone uh, would probably be in a situation that they would fit into this environment. And so fit is also a very key component as you are bringing uh, students and faculty and staff to your particular institution and making sure that they uh, feel like they are part of the, the community and uh, a valued and respected uh, component to, to the success of the institution. So foreign nationals, let's move to the next one. I've had quite a lot of experience uh, around promotion and tenure. Having gone through promotion and tenure myself uh, four times at uh, different institutions, uh, I think I know a little bit about promotion and tenure from both sides. But what I want to think about from your perspective as department heads is what is what is my role in promotion and tenure? And it really ties back to mentoring and what I would say is giving feedback. So I'll talk very briefly about uh, the, the sorts of things that come up time and time again as I review portfolios and then recommend people for tenure and promotion onto my chancellor. I think the big thing for anyone coming into an institution is to make sure that uh, they know what the expectations are coming in. And those expectations are often documented in collegial review documents or departmental uh, documents. And a lot of those are not as clear as we think they should be because as people work on these documents, particularly within a department, it is a tough thing to do. But if you do not have clear expectations for your colleagues coming into your department, then uncertainty starts to occur right from the very beginning. And we want our tenure and promotion process to be as clear as possible. And so here you have a double issue of management and leadership. You've got to get people through the process. They've got to be clear. There's 
there's guidelines, all of those things there. But then how do you help that person be successful? And for me, the key components there are that it takes more than one person to mentor. And in fact, I really like to suggest as new faculty that they find someone in the department, someone at the college, and someone else um, so that they have three people that they can talk to at, from different perspectives. So having that clear vision of what you want to do, you've got to then also have people that will help you, mentor you through that, that process. Um, the, the clarity of the, the management part, the clarity of the portfolio development, um, the, the expectations, the process really should be done up front. And the mentors should know what those processes are. The mentor's role is also to make sure that the people get formative feedback. This is not, it's, this is not just in the first year. This is essential for ongoing future professional development success within the department. Formative feedback does not mean you're not doing this well, you need to go and get remediation. Formative feedback is here are some areas that you do really well and here are some things that, we, that you would help you be more successful. And here's some resources that might help you move in that direction. Formative feedback is one of the things that over the years I've seen as being something that is less um, upfront and tends to cause a little uncertainty if, you, if it's not given on a regular basis. And so clarity of the process and then clarity of expectations is really important. I'll add to this that we often ask people to present portfolios for tenure and promotion. And really, faculty should be developing that portfolio from the minute they start at an institution. It's easy to update if you've got it in your hand. It's, um, if you've got clear guidelines, it's easy to put together. Uh, when you don't have a lot of material to, put, to start to put in it, then you can add to it as you go through. And then um, you can have your colleagues look at this and get that formative feedback uh, as you progress through the process to tenure and promotion. So, the other, the last thing I'll say before moving on to the next slide is that in promotion and tenure, it is often at institutions not clear what an assistant professor looks like, what an associate professor looks like, or what a full professor looks like within your discipline. And if you have clear, uh, clear vision, clear clarity of process, and cl clear expectations, then all of your faculty will be successful. Next slide, please. In grievances, it is all about emotion. What we want to make sure is that in a grievance process that you are very clear on that process. You need to know exactly, right up front before you even have grievances, exactly what the process is. You need to make sure that you have gathered the data, so that you have clear information, and that you have documented that information. I would also say that in grievances, once you get to grievances, that's sometimes a little difficult to remediate. But the hope is that before you even get to this point, that people have been given a chance to remediate and that that has been documented. And so that when grievances come up, you can show that efforts have been made to help that person be successful. With grievances also, I think you have to deal with the issues soon and do it with real data. Manage the process clearly. Manage it respect to, uh, res with respect so that people know that they have been heard. And I hear that time and time again when I've had to deal with these situations. Just saying to somebody, tell me your story, tell me your side, and then let me um, assure you that I have heard you. That's really, really important to people. And then um, transparency. With grievances, once it gets to that point, there is, a, there is a, a, a place where transparency can no longer occur. Because if it's a personnel issue, there are things you cannot say. So again, going back to the process is make sure that you know and get guidance on what you can say and when you ca what you ca cannot say to an individual or to others who are involved in the grievance process. I hope you never have to go through grievances. But in fact, as, uh, since 95% of our job is working with people, uh, some of these things are bound to happen. And uh, they can be related to some of the issues that uh, Patrick talked about. Uh, but please make sure that you've got the data and that you know what the processes are before you move forward. Next slide, please. 
personal personnel management. As I said, 95% of our jobs is really working with people. And it really is about respect. Again, we're, same with tenure and promotion. If you have uh, colleagues that are instructors or um, non-tenure tracked uh, faculty, uh, you've got to make sure that you know what they're doing, what their successes are, and what they need to be working on. And so make your expectations clear. I do this right from the moment that I hire somebody to sit down and talk about what the expectations are. And then, uh, as I mentioned with the tenure promotion portfolio, it's not something that you wait until your sixth year to do. It's something that you do all the time. And so that formative feedback is really, really important to make sure that the progress is, is the person is progressing successfully. I talk a lot about succession planning. And some people talk about that in terms of, of believe that that means that they're getting ready to, to take the position of the person that's right in front of them. And succession planning is really preparing people, person for the next position, whether it's at that institution or at another institution. So always prepare, prepare for succession, but be clear with people exactly what succession means. That means that you're giving people the opportunity to have the, the skills, behaviors, and attitudes that will help them get that next job. And I always work with people and say, okay, what is it that you want to do? What skills do you have? What do you not, uh, not have? And then how can I help you get those skills? So that helps them prepare for succession. Always making sure that, you can, can, that, that everybody has the opportunity to contribute and provide feedback and giving feedback. We work as a community. We do not work in isolation. And so encouraging people to make sure that they have the, um, the, the feeling that they can contribute without retribution. And that's a big thing within a department. Sometimes people, depending on their position, do not feel like they have a voice. Your job as a leader is to make sure that everyone has a voice and everyone can be respected for their, um, for their contributions and that that feedback uh, while completely critical to everyone's success, the department's success, the individual success, the, the colleague's success, is, um, is, it's really, really critical to, to make sure you do that. Moving on to our next topic. I've talked several times, and, and Patrick's talked several times, about the use of, of, of being transparent. Decision making should involve many people. Your job as a leader is to make sure that all voices are heard. That means that if you have to make a decision, that you need to collect your data. You need to make sure that you have everything in front of you, that you communicate well, that you're consistent in your communication. And the one thing that I think is hardest to do, but I encourage people to think about it, is listen to other people and it's okay to change your mind. You're not seen as a weaker leader because you've changed your mind based on solid data. And so the easiest option is to make a decision behind closed doors, but if you don't reach out and really hear other voices and other ideas, then you're not going to be the leader that you want to be and aspire to be if, you don't, if you're not inclusive and you're not transparent. So I fully encourage you to um, think about diversity and inclusion in a way of diversity of thought, bringing, bringing ideas to the table that will really help people be successful, the, not only the department, as I say, but the college and the institution, really, really key. So sometimes it's easier to make decisions behind closed doors. My recommendation, and what I'm hearing from Patrick also, is that is not the right way to go around uh, making the, the right decision and not, not to look at changing your mind as being a weakness, but in fact a strength. Last but not least, uh, I think this is one of the things that we tend not to do very well, and that's looking after ourselves. Um, think about your leadership style. Get, continue with professional development. What, what's good about your leadership style, and what are people seeing as not good about your leadership style? So getting Mentoring, getting your own uh, formative feedback is really, really important. Your communication style. It might work with some people and might not work for others. So how do you make sure that when you're communicating, you're communicating clearly to all your stakeholders? Some of you are working internally. Some of you are working representing uh, the college. 
and the university donors, as Patrick has mentioned, uh, are people that uh, are very important to us. What about your alumni? Um, how are you communicating with them and keeping them in touch with, with what's happening in the department? And so your leadership style, your communication style, really comes down to continually seeking that formative feedback to make sure that you are getting the information that you need to be successful as the leader of your department or unit. And so I will tell you that I've been in professional development for about 20 years, and I've been teaching for 36 years, and I continue to learn, and I think that's the most exciting part of any job, uh, is that you continue to learn, even under times of great stress and pressure. Uh, it's so great to, to learn how to do things better, how to do things easier, um, and how to do things that will really move the units forward in a significant way. And also, you have to think about your own succession planning. What is it you aspire to do? What skills, behaviors, and attitudes do you need to learn or hone so that you'll be successful in the next step of your development? I think we're up for questions at this point in time. And uh, I know that uh, we're doing a little bit of uh, uh, reading of some questions that are coming up. But I'll hand this back over to Patrick, because I think the first question that you have is to do with uh, dealing with dealing with Title IX issues. Before, before we get started, I'm going to moderate out the, the questions today. And I just want to remind our attendees, if uh, you have any questions or comments, please feel free to type them in the questions box um, so that we can see them. And I see that there are some current and former chairs that are also attendees. So if you have any comments or extensions upon what was discussed today that you would like to share, we'd appreciate that as well. Um, so we have a question related to Title IX, and um, without going into details about the actual Title IX example, if there's a ex specific example um, that you can think of where Title IX um, became a part of a part of the issue um, and how that may have affected the the final outcome, how that may have affected your faculty or staff, and if that affected the morale of department, and if there's any impact on the students, if y'all have any uh, examples. Um, I, I will start, if you don't mind, um, I, because unfortunately I've had a few, um, and as a provost, uh, you come up uh, to actually the investigations come to you when they deal with a student or with uh, a faculty, and unfortunately both uh, that I have to deal with, uh, dealt with students, both actually were very clear. Um, so both uh, led to a very significant action. Uh, so, you know, and pretty rapid uh, dismissal of the guilty party, uh, who in both cases had, you know, uh, agreed that this had happened. I can tell you that um, what um, I am not too sure of what the result in the morale was in the uh, department or, you know, in the unit, because that was a pretty... Um, that was not an open issue. That was just brought up to investigation. What I can share is that how I felt completely out of my uh, zone and experience and suddenly having to um, become a judge in a sense. If anything, I take solace in the fact that those cases were very, very clear and that um, in both cases, the old party had accepted their position and actions. Um, so we had we made a decision to act swiftly and pretty um, discreetly, but it leaves you in a position um, of loneliness and uh, asking yourself, uh, you know, did you sign up to do these things? Because some of the things you end up reading can be very very disturbing, and you have to prepare yourself. My guess and my recommendation is that you always find yourself allies and mentors, people who have done this work before or at a higher level um, that understand the issues and that you can confide in, not in the details, but in your emotional state. Because you can't uh, share that much with the people that report to you. That's one part of the job. It becomes a little lonely. And you need sometimes to have people you can bounce things off or you can just empty your your whole bag, if you will, because you have this whole weight on your heart. So make sure that when you do that, be very clear uh, about you know uh, where your university stand, where your moral compass is, 
in the end, uh, you will have to actually have some form of, you know, of uh, emotional, um, you will feel some emotional drain regardless. And, and especially, I would assume, if the issue is not clear. And uh, you will have to deal with that in one way or another. Thank you very much. Um, we talked a little bit about the tenure process, and I'm curious if um, there's ever been any discussion while you've been um, in leadership about potential changes to the tenure process or changes to requirements and how those conversations may have gone. I can certainly answer that. I think the, the tenure and promotion process should be always sort of under scrutiny. And I know that over the years, every time we've gone through the process to the point where it uh, comes to the provost office, uh, that we, I sit down with the university level committee that usually reviews the portfolios prior, with a recommendation to me prior to going on to the chancellor or president. And at that point in time, uh, when we see that the process is unclear or there are documents that are unclear, then it is there, that is the opportunity to, to change that. Those changes have to go back to Faculty Senate for approval and scrutiny, and I think that's uh, absolutely the right thing to do. And then everyone is informed of those changes. I think the tension that occurs is at the department level with the criteria. If that is not clear, then uh, that can really be a disadvantage to colleagues who are coming through the process. And so I also would say that it's a departmental responsibility to make sure that the criteria for each of the area or, um, areas of, of promotion or tenure uh, are clear and are transparent and that there are no surprises. And uh, I always say that you should be going through the process at a steady state and that when you come to tenure and promotion to associate, it should be like a speed bump. You just, if you're going at the right speed, you hardly notice it, and you just keep going towards full professor. But at each time, you need to make sure that you look at who the, who the people are, what criteria you set forth, and are you, are you mentoring people to be successful. And then if, they're, if, they're, if it's early on in the process where we find that somebody is not going to be successful, it's a much better situation to help with the remediation or to help that person see that that is not a good fit for them. Uh, that's the leadership, that's the mentorship, that's the professionalism and the respect that we should apply to all of our colleagues. And if I may, I'll just add a few things uh, just because our institution has, um, has evolved. I think every institution as individuals evolve and some standards sometimes uh, change over time. So some of those standards for tenure and promotion, you know, have changed over 20 years. People who've been here for 20, 30 years um, have been evaluated and under different circumstances when the university and the institution particularly has progressed uh, in its uh, order department. And I, I will reiterate what Allison has said, you know, having university level clear guidance and guidelines that are reviewed every year and that are reviewed by all faculty in the Faculty Senate. For example, there is not only the promotion and tenure, but the post-tenure review in some cases when those happen. And we, we have had a very significant review of our post-tenure post review process, uh, which went to the uh, Faculty um, uh, Senate. And then it's how the different departments take that on. And the departments themselves, are they, they evolve faster, usually, than the entire institution. Can actually need to review their uh, guidelines and what you know are the standards uh, regularly and making sure that every faculty is you know have a chance to vote and, and to have an input on that so again it's very clear and those standards can be uh, transparent to uh, the university committee when they actually review uh, dossiers that are not in their specialty if you will thank you so without getting too political uh, we're curious if, um, with the with the current administration stance on immigration, if it has led to conversations on your campus um, on how to deal with these potential changes. It has. Allison, you want to start? <laughs> <laughs> I 
can uh, too. Well, I, yeah, go. on you go. Um, okay, yes it has. Um, I think that what's really important, and this is the, the position that we've taken, is to be very clear where you stand as an institution from a core value perspective. And if part of your uh, values, and it is part of A&M, is you know, one of respect and inclusion, then you have to make sure that you, you have a clear message for all of these individuals that belong to you know, other nationalities that are visiting, whether they're student, faculty, postdocs, what have you, and then deploy energy to make sure that you, know, you smooth out the possibility for them to be successful and not see the process, the speed bump, as Allison was saying. And, you know, yes, there are processes that they need to follow, whether they use H-1B, J-1 visas, and what have you. You have to work very closely with your Office of International Scholars and Students if you have one, and you have, and if you don't, you have to have at least a few people that are really uh, well-versed with immigration policies, what your university immigration policy is, if you give or not any type of support for applications for uh, non-nationals. Uh, and if you are, you know, um, university that is significantly large, actually even smaller universities have a very large, uh, you know, percentage of students or faculty that come from elsewhere. So you have to face it and you have to really engage with your groups. That's the management piece. The leadership piece is meeting with these groups and having clear communication to the groups that you are valuing in the same way as everybody else. That you're going to give them the support that they, that they deserve and making sure that you respond when they're there. Uh, we've had a few people uh, stuck out of our borders um, in, you know, early in the year, and we had to work with these people to make sure that they knew that we would work with them to actually uh, get them their visas to get back to their studies or their work. And I would completely agree with everything that Patrick uh, mentioned. I think specifically and, and particularly in the leadership meeting with with people who are affected and clear communication on a, on a regular basis about the respect and value that diversity and inclusion has with an, a, on an institution is, is good. I will say that, um, and it's not just good, but it's essential, I will say that um, upper administration is often called upon to be the voice. And while that is absolutely a, a good thing to do, uh, it really comes to how we act as an institution at the staff and faculty, uh, administration, all of those, all components of the university have to be involved in a respectful dialogue around all of this. And so we talk about shared governance, although we haven't mentioned that particularly in this uh, webinar so far, but when things happen, when um, items are put in your welcome basket, um, it is not just one individual's responsibility to respond. It is everybody's responsibility to, to make sure that we provide welcoming environments for all of our students and faculty and staff that come to our campuses. Thank you very much. Um, another question, where can, um, where can one person, where can a person as a chair get professional development outside of the campus? Are there any national organizations um, that offer training related to uh, the job of being a chair or administrator? Uh, well, go ahead, go ahead. Oh, sorry. Um, so having been in professional development for a long time, there are some, uh, some particular societies that, uh, and institutions that offer discipline-specific chair development, which I think is wonderful and is, is really helpful within the discipline. There's not a lot out there in terms of specific chair development, but there's a lot in terms of leadership development. And so you can look at the American Council on Education. You can look at um, the deans and, and directors, uh, I'm thinking the Council, Council of uh, National Sciences, I believe, has uh, some development as well. Um, obviously, the Pranodi's uh, group is doing uh, chair development. But a lot of what you need to think about is it's great to be specific for chairs, but chairs or, or unit heads are very different from institution to institution, and their responsibilities are very, very different. And so I would encourage your own institution 
to to bring uh, department heads or chairs together uh, on a regular basis to make sure that they get what they need uh, in context of the institution. And so I know here at Western Carolina University, we have uh, regular meetings with our department heads to help them with budget, to help them with Title IX, to help them with many of the things that we've talked about today. Um, and so having your faculty center for teaching and learning uh, be the instigator of that or uh, someone in the provost's office to be a leader in that I think is really essential for the for the local needs but the broader leadership uh, areas can be found in many many different areas and avenues. So um, I'll add to this it um, sometimes depending on where where you are located conferences of universities will do this for example the SEC will tend to have a leadership program that actually does apply to uh, chairs uh, and we as at Texas a and send several uh, individuals every year and uh, they go through a semester long um, leadership program where they meet at different locations and they have readings and they do that type of work. Um, yes, the American Council for Education has some of those leaderships. One of the things that I'd like to uh, encourage you as chairs and heads is have a conversation with your dean with your personal development, the need for your personal development. By you being effective, you make them effective and the college effective. And by asking for time and resources for you to actually get this leadership training, um, it's really not much. It's usually a few days travel. It's you know um, getting into a conference, so paying for the fees. It's really little compared to the returns of you actually getting, first of all, building a network across the nation, understanding how different you know, best practices in your field or overall in academia. And having that conversation, I actually now have instigated or started a program in my own units where basically I'm funding um, different uh, unit leaders to go to these development uh, programs. So because I feel that this is really important. Um, so this comes more from me to them, but you can actually do that. Knock on the door of your dean and say, listen, you know, I think I need a little time to reflect and converse and understand how I can become more effective. And it's a very hard one to, um, to not support because the, the amount of money for the return is very minimal. 